today for an exploration of J.R.R. Tolkien and the wisdom that he has to share, I would like to read from his personal letters. I have three here that I would like to read that are in particular dedicated or expresses his love for trees and his deep feeling and concern for them on earth which inspired his characters of the Ents, as you can guess. The tree spirits and the guardians that protected and defended the forest. So this is June 29th, 1955. There are of certain things and themes that move me especially. The inner relations between the noble and the simple or common vulgar, for instance, the ennoblement of the ignoble, I find specially moving. I am obviously much in love with plants and above all trees, and always have been, and I find human maltreatment of them as hard to bear as some fine ill treatment of animals. The next letter where he talks about a short story, Leaf by Niggle, is September 9th, 1962. I am now sending you Leaf by Niggle. I have had a copy made specially to keep, if you wish, from the Dublin Review, in which it appeared nearly 20 years ago. It was written, I think, just before the war began, though I first read it aloud to my friends early in 1940. I recollect nothing about the writing, except that I woke one morning with it in my head, scribbled it down, and the printed form in the main hardly differs from the first hasty version at all. I find it still quite moving when I reread it. It is not really or properly an allegory so much as mythical, for Niggle is meant to be a real mixed quality person and not an allegory of any single vice or virtue. The name Parish proved convenient for the porter's joke, but it was not given with any intention of special significance. I once knew of a gardener called Parish. I see there are six parishes in our telephone book. Of course, some elements are explicable in biographical terms, so obsessively interesting to modern critics that they often value a piece of literature solely in so far as it reveals the author and especially if that is in a discreditable light. There was a great tree, a huge poplar, with vast limbs, visible through my window, even as I lay in bed. I loved it, and was anxious about it. It had been savagely mutilated some years before, but had gallantly grown new limbs, though of course not with the unblemished grace of its former natural self. And now a foolish neighbor was agitating to have it felled. Every tree has its enemies. Few have an advocate. Too often the hate is irrational, a fear of anything large and alive, and not easily tamed or destroyed, though it may clothe itself in pseudo-rational terms. This fool said that it cut off the sun from her house and garden and that she feared for her house if it should crash in a high wind. It stood due east of her front door, across a wide road, at a distance nearly thrice its total height. Thus only about the equinox would it even cast a shadow in her direction, and only in the very early morning one that reached across the road to the pavement outside her front gate. And any wind that could have uprooted it and hurled it at her house would have demolished her and her house without any assistance from the tree. I believe it still stands where it did, though many winds have blown since. The great gale in which the dreadful winter of 1946 to 47 ended on March 17, 1947, blew down nearly all the mighty trees of the boardwalk in Christchurch Meadows and devastated Magdalene Deer Park but it did not lose a bow. 
Also, of course, I was anxious about my own internal tree, the Lord of the Rings. It was growing out of hand and revealing endless new vistas, and I wanted to finish it, but the world was threatening. And I was dead stuck somewhere about chapter 10, The Voice of Saruman, in book 3, with fragments ahead, some of which eventually fitted into chapter 1 and 3 of book 5, but most of which proved wrong, especially about Mordor, and I did not know how to go on. It was not until Christopher was carried off to South Africa that I forced myself to write book 4, which was sent out to him bit by bit. That was 1944. I did not finish the first rough writing till 1949, when I remember blotting the pages, which now represents the welcome of Frodo and Sam on the field of Cormalin. With tears as I wrote, I then myself typed the whole of that work, all six books out, and then once again in revision, in places, many times, mostly on my bed, in the attic of the tiny terrace house, to which war had exiled us from the house in which my family had grown up. But none of that really illuminates leaf by niggle much, does it? If it has any virtues, they remain as such. Whether you know all this or do not, I hope you think it has some virtue, but for quite some different reasons. I think you may like the personal details. That is because you are a dear and take an interest in other people, especially as rightly your kin. And that was a letter to Jane Neve, who is Tolkien's aunt, who was living in Wales. So he was telling her about this tree that inspired him to write the story Leaf by Niggle and create this character around this true story that I guess happened in his life. And he saw it in a different perspective than what his neighbor did as far as looking at this tree and not seeing it as causing a problem, as she did. The last letter I want to read is June 6, 1972. And this is answering the question, did the Ents ever find the Ent wives? As for the Ent wives, I do not know. I have written nothing beyond the first few years of the Fourth Age, except the beginning of a tale supposed to refer to the end of the reign of Elderon about a hundred years after the death of Aragorn. Then I, of course, discovered that the king's peace would contain no tales worth recounting, and its wars would have little interest after the overthrow of Sauron, but that almost certainly a restlessness would appear about them, owing to the, it seems, inevitable boredom of men with the good, there would be secret societies practicing dark cults and orc cults among adolescents. But I think in volume 2, page 80 to 81, it is plain that there would be for Ents no reunion in history. But Ents and their wives, being rational creatures, would find some earthly paradise until the end of this world, beyond which the wisdom neither of elves nor Ents could see. Though maybe they shared the hope of Aragorn, that they were not bound forever to the circles of the world, and beyond them is more than memory. So as you can see, he dearly loved the trees. And there's a famous quote by Tolkien, I am at home among the trees. So in the spirit of Tolkien, I share this all with you. And may you find the same love of trees that Tolkien did as well. I also wanted to take the time to thank those that have joined me in the fundraiser for OneTreePlanted.org. It is one of my favorite sites to use to put towards your money to help replant trees. It is a dollar a tree and they will send you information where your tree has been planted. You can choose a location anywhere where you would like to plant more trees and to help with bringing back our forests back to life once again. So thank you all for your contribution and I will continue this fundraiser until I feel that we have made the ends happy and of course J.R.R. Tolkien 
with our care and concern for the way trees are cut down and treated. <laughs>